Salve Latinisti! This is going to be the best video on the perfect tense on the internet because as you watch this video you will learn what the letters of the verb actually signify on a subconscious level. This is a video for writelatin.org using the Lingua Latina per se la strada textbook. So today we're going to review time and completeness which are the two attributes of tense, the formulation of the perfect tense, its expression, we'll practice it, and then your standard irregular verbs to be, to want, and not want, and to go with all its prefixes. Then I'll say a few words about how you're going to be expected to memorize every verb's third and fourth principal part from here on out, and how to do that as efficiently and effectively as possible. Lastly, we'll end with learning passives. I suggest that you download this PowerPoint that I'm using here, which is down in the video description. So, first thing we need to do is review what the symbolism is. Thumb towards you means I, you, he, she, it, we, y'all, and they. We also covered this concept of the two kinds of completeness. There's complete action, that's action that happened at a distinct moment in time, and that it's finished, done with, and no longer occurring. And then there's incomplete action, which is the tent, all the tenses that we've learned so far, the imperfect, the present, and the future. So today we are going to learn our first complete tense, which again is something that happened at a distinct moment in time and is done. Alrighty, and that tense that we're going to learn today is going to be the perfect tense. So we had the imperfect, which was past tense and incomplete. We had the future, which was future and incomplete, but today we're going to have the perfect, which is past and complete. And you can see here that the perfect can occur anywhere in this area, anywhere before the present. The perfect is the first tense of what's called the perfect system, which includes these three tenses, and they are all the same in that they all use what's called the perfect stem which is the third principal part, but we will get into that in a second. First off, though, let's see where this tense lies on the House of Latin. So it is obviously this first orange tense right to the left of the present, and its endings, e is the it, emus istis erunt, are actually kind of thought of as being in the present, but you'll understand that better in a second. But now we have to go into the gold, the honey from the honeycomb, about how to understand the perfect tense. And you'll only get this from this video. Okay, so the most common sign of the perfect tense is a V. And it occurs right at the end of the perfect stem. So the perfect stem would be vocav here. So the function of this V is subconsciously to suggest a hiatus. Now what's a hiatus? A hiatus is a break or emptiness in something. From the Latin word heo, hiare, like panting, like you're out of breath and nothing's happening. So the V suggests to the listener a break in time in between the present when it's being talked about and the past back when the action occurred. So it's at this break in time that you can see symbolized by this orange arrow. And it's also a break in my voice signifying that real break in time. So, you know, the hiatus kind of bespeaks, the V here bespeaks a separation in time between now and, and the past when the event occurred. And this is how you do it. This is the voice wave of your voice. As you're saying, wokawi, Notice how when I say we, the W sound, my lips go down, close, and the sound ceases. And that's what you see here as the wave goes down to nothing. So when you hear that momentary break in sound, you know that you should imagine a separation in time between the woka, which is the calling, and the E, which is right now. Okay, so wokawi. Um, you know, it's almost like a fence there saying, you can't go there. Well, you're here in the present, and that was back then in the past. All right. Oh, now, V is not the only 
sign of the perfect sense. There are some others. Most common, of course, is U, because remember, V and U were the same letter. So it's only for our sake in our manuscripts that we separate them as U and V. But if you see a U here, well, that's the same thing as V, right? Um, weedy, here's another sign of the perfect tense. Now this one is not so obvious. The V occurs like in 60% of the words, but you know, there's another 40% that doesn't follow that tip-off flag sign of the perfect tense. One tip-off you'll we'll learn about is a lengthened stem vowel. So this used to be short I in the present, but now in the perfect it becomes a long I. So wideo becomes weedy. And that lengthening of it is kind of an overemphasis, meaning to suggest to you that it happened back then, not now. Like weedy back then, right? Okay. Here's another lengthened stem vowel, ago, agare, I do, becomes agi, I did. And you can see the, the waveform of your voice. Notice that your waveform does go down to nothing, just as in the case of V. You know, it's a G, but, you know, it does, if you say it rightly, it does break. And that's what you want, because you want to your voice to signify reality. So, agi is the best way to say it. Weedy. All right, what else? There's a stutter, and the technical term for this is reduplication. So if the stem stutters, steti, that's letting you know that it occurred back then in the past. And kukuri, that's another stutter, another reduplication, and letting you know that it happened back then in the past. In this case, with a stutter, with stutters, you see where the break occurs? It's right there between the repeated consonant. Steti, kukuri. So anytime you hear that break, that hiatus, you know that it happened way back there in the past. So, therefore, as you listen to a perfect tense verb like this one, imagine what each part of the word means. V at the end of the stem or the stutter suggests a separation, a fence, a hiatus. The stem itself suggests action before, and the ending is going to suggest the current state of being now. And notice here, these endings are really dry. They're not like ego. They have this crinky sound, isti, which kind of lets you know that there's no life in them, and they're only reporting about the real life back in the past. So these endings are going to be like a dry tree that has no leaves on it. So when you hear this, action before the current state of being, and have called, or you can leave out the have, because have called and called are both the same thing, aren't they? Like, they both happened back there in the past. Have called, I have called, I called. Same thing, right? So the have is optional. And then last comes your ending, called you. Alrighty, so you've already got the understanding of the perfect tense. And most students don't get this. Most students just learn, oh, well, there's a V at the end. But they don't know what that V signifies. So now you will have that much more advantage over others. And you can hopefully clue them in, too, about how to think of about the perfect tense. Okay, so formulation. How do you form this? Well, you start off with the perfect stem, which is, as I said, the third principal part in your glossary. of, And so therefore, in all your future words, now you're going to have not two, but three principal parts. In fact, in this chapter, you're going to get the fourth one also, but that's in a different video. So under what letters does it occur? Um, v, U, Length and stem file, reduplication, there's a couple others, like X. X is a sign of the perfect. And time and completeness, well, the time is past, and the completeness is complete. All right, so first say the Latin. Habui, habuisti, habuit, habuimus, habuistis, habuerunt. Now say the English. I have had, you have had, she has had, we have had, y'all have had, they have had. Um, wokawi, wokawisti, wokawit, wokawimus, wokawistis, wokawairunt. And then the other thing that is used to construct the perfect tense, of course, is the endings. 
And I think it's a good idea to compare these to the present just so you get associating between these two in case you ever have to change one tense into the other. So in the present you had O, but in the perfect you have E. Is now becomes isti, t becomes it. Really it doesn't change because both of these could be I, T, depending on the conjugation. Mus does change because it gets I at the start. Emus, that's new. Tis changes because it gets an eth at the start. Eestis. So compare this. Isti and eestis. Notice where the long I occurs. So anyways, and then last becomes arunt. So really, all these singulars have a long I at the end. Eat is kind of almost, you could say it like a long I, even though it's so short that we don't draw it as long. But you could draw it as long. So you All right, now this is the important part that you need to watch. We already covered its endings are est it, emus istis erunt, but now these are the tip-offs to the perfect stem. V like wokawi, U like habui. There's also S like skrifsit, double S like diskesit, X like dikit becomes diksit. You know, an X is kind of a CS, so you can think of this one as just an extra S too. So, you know, X is kind of the same thing as S. We did the stutter or reduplication, dead it, you know. We did the lengthened stem vowel, agat becomes agat, wit it becomes weed it, fuck it becomes fake it, emit becomes aim it. Now notice that you might confuse these two if you're not watching out for the macron on top, because they look very similar. And then lastly, a few words don't change at all, and you can't tell the difference except by context. Respondent, he responds, becomes respondent, he responded, and they're identically the same. But those are rare. Expression. Okay, so I want to say a word first about where these endings probably came from. And in particular, take a look at the third plural down here, arunt. Where did that come from? Well, it probably almost certainly came from UNT, but look at this long E. Where did, well, how unusual is that? It's not like any of the others. Well, that probably came from some, from erunt, so that it was an I like the other I's. Now, um, even further back, we can guess that it must have, it would have wanted to be like wokav e unt. So it probably would have wanted to be something like that even further back, but that would not have lasted very stably or very longly because it's so tempting to let a consonant like R slip into there in between the E and the U. So let's think a second about this theoretical form from ancient history. If, could it have ever possibly been a short I-U-N-T? Could you ever get a long E from a short I, do you think? You know, short I is the shortest vowel sound that exists. It's almost nothing. And a long E is a solid thing. So this is probably not very likely. It probably in ancient times was, in fact, long I-U-N-T. Now, if that's the case, then take a look at this. Based on these two forms, what can we say about the other four? That's right. Yeah, they probably had a long vowel too at some ancient time. Because it's easy for a long I to become a short I, but it's not easy for a short I down here to become a long hard E. Alrighty, so based on that, we can guess that this is what the endings would have been once upon a time. This is what I call the ancient pronunciation, and you will hear me subconsciously slip into this. So please don't throw a fit if you do, but I'll rattle off e isti eat, emus istis erunt. I don't really say erunt, <laughs> but you could. But anyways, so my explanation for why this is not written down like this is because, well, the long I here, although it is hard, I don't hold it for a space of two counts like you are supposed to do with all long vowels. So I just say emus, not emus. So who knows how it would have been pronounced around the time of Caesar. 
perhaps it was already changing by then over to an imus, or perhaps it was a hard imus at that point, but just a fast one. So, you know, if you want to slip into this and express the perfect in this archaic sounding way that reminds you about the common nature of all six of these endings, then go ahead and do that, but just know that it's not written like that because this first person plural and second person plural do have a short I in the ending. So how are we going to say this? Well, we already learned that there was a hump in the present stem tenses, but these perfect stem tenses are the opposite. These perfect system tenses have a dip, a valley, or I like to call it a curly cue because you kind of swallow your spit when you get half through, huh? All right, so ukawi. You might call this the nub, the bite, or the crunch in the sound. And of course, what it suggests, you see here, it suggests action, and then a hiatus of nothing going on, and then the, the speaker telling you about it right now. Ukawi and dixi. Hear how my voice makes a silent recovery? Dixi. And you can almost imagine your voice doing that. All right, so now let's practice it. First, the perfect stem. It is made by taking the third principal part and removing the ending. And you're left with habu in this case. So habui, habuisti, habuit, habuimus, habuistis, habuerunt. And say it a second time. Habui, habuisti, habuit, habuimus, habuistis, habuerunt. And say it a third time. Habui, habuisti, habuit, habuimus, habuistis, habuerunt. Hopefully you can do the fourth time with your eyes closed stopping the video just from memory by now. So let's start the practices. Which word is this one? Take the third principal part, remove the ending, habu, and then put the correct person, it, habu it. Try the next one. Habu runt, right? And you can practice all the rest. Let's jump on to the verb to be. So, so far we haven't really kept good track of the verb to be, but um, this was its form in the imperfect, I was being. This was its form in the future, I will be. Its form in the present was sum es est, sum es est sunt. But now we're going to get its form in the perfect. The stem is just in fu. Fui, fuisti, fuit, fuimus. Fuistis, fuerunt. Can't you just hear how that F just refers back to what I was back then? It's so elegant. So, sum is your present, I am, S said to be, fui, I was. I was, or I have been, you were, she was, we were, y'all were, they were. Mr. Rudman, Mr. Rudman, um, I thought you weren't supposed to use was because was was the imperfect tense. No. The imperfect tense was was being, right? Was blanking. You need the ing to suggest ongoingness of the imperfect tense. But now you can translate the perfect tense as just was with no ing ending. So you now have two ways to translate it, like called and have called, and then in this case you have were and have been was and were being was the imperfect, but that had an ing suffix on it, ing. So again, the perfect tense of the verb to be is fui, fuisti, fuit, fuimus, fuistis, fuerunt. Having learned the verb to be, we can now add on the prefix able to be. And of course, you know potis here from previous tenses. It goes on the front like that as pot. However, the difference with the perfect tense is that the F disappears, or what's called elides away. It elides out, and you're left with just this, potui. Because, of course, think about it. You can't really say very easily potfui, can you? will naturally become potui. So this is your perfect tense form of able to be.
Potui, I was able. Potuisti, you were able. Potuit, he or she it was able. Potuimus, we were able. Potuistis, y'all were able. And Potuirant, they were able. And the translation, of course, is has or have been or was able. All right, say it a second time. Potui, potuisti, potuit, potuimus, potuistis, potuirant. And say it a third time from memory. Good. And the translation has or have been or was or were able. Okay, also notice this similarity here that you want to not get tripped up by. Potuerunt in the past tense, meaning was able. So it looks a lot like the future word poterunt, meaning will be able. Although they both have the same letters, the past tense has a U or a hiatus or a split. So if you say it correctly, you will hear the difference. Potuerunt. And remember, that's the one that in my theory was actually long I-R-U-N-T. Potuerunt. So you can even use that also as a cue to your ear to distinguish it from poterunt. But in any case, the U is a definite separation, separating the pot way back in time from the irunt right now. Um, unlike poterunt in the future, which is just nice and smooth with no separation at all. So just watch out for that very close similarity. Okay, so starting from the third principal part of Wolla Wella Wolloi and Nolo Nolle Nolui, um, these two are going to go exactly according to the rules. So, E is the it, Emus is the And so this is how it's going to sound Wolloi, I wanted, you wanted, he, she, it wanted, we wanted, y'all wanted, they wanted. And there they are. And, of course, the translation is wanted or has wanted. Now, you say it a second time. Ready? Go. Wolui, woluisti, woluit, woluimus, woluistis, woluerunt. All right, and hopefully you said that. And now for didn't want. These are just the same, except the VO becomes an N longo. Okay, so say it a first time. Nolui, noluisti, noluit. Noluimus, noluistis, noluerunt. So they didn't want. Oh. And the translation is wanted not, or has not wanted. Either one of those. Say it again. Nolui, noluisti, noluit. Noluimus, noluistis, noluerunt. Alrighty, and hopefully that's what you said. Now to the verb to go. This will be a little bit harder. All right, in the present tense, we had the verbs to be and to go, and they looked like this. Sum and eo, es and is, est and it, sumus and imus, estus and itis, and sunt and eunt. And we had the long i as the sign of the go, and su or es as the sign of being, of the, of the verb to be. Then in the imperfect, we had era and iba everywhere. MST, mustis, and TT, very normal with macrons right there. Now in the perfect, this is what we're going to have. Fu as was, were, or has been, and I as went, to which we're going to tack on the endings I isti it, imus istis erunt, and notice that the macrons are right there. Fui, I was, fuisti, you were, fuit, he, she, it was, fuimus, we were, fuistis, y'all were, Fuerant, they were. Over here, i i, i isti, i it, i imus, i istis, i erant. Now you might say, wow, the past tense of go sounds bizarre. Just an i as the whole stem is just i? Well, it came from something else. It came from iwi. And so sometimes you'll st still see iwi. It's like an archaic older form. But it e is obviously what it ended up as because it's much faster to say ad e e than it is to say ad e we, which is like so emphatic that nobody wants to bother with that. So the only thing I'd really point out to you is that you really want to separate the two syllables, the two double i's, it e, 
it is the it 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 emus it is this it aerant okay so the double i is the tip off of oh this is the perfect of to go went alrighty and occasionally the double i will condense into one long i easty or eastus but that's pretty rare I won't use these, so I'm just putting them in here just in case you ever run into that. This is what I'll use instead. Very regular. Now, remember this word go, the present of go? Let's compare it to the perfect of go, which is went. So, is and isti. They're the same in the is, but the perfect has a double i and also a suffix. Um, what else? It and it. it. Alright, so make sure you can tell the difference between these two. One has an I and the other one has a double I. So you gotta watch out for how many I's it has, because otherwise you're gonna get the tense wrong. So goes versus went. Same up with the mus. Emus is in both, but one has emus. We went back then. It, and if you say it correctly with and if you say it correctly, separating the two I's into two separate syllables, then that'll be a clue to your ear that there's a separation between now, the emus, and the action back then. I. I emus. I e. I isti. I it. I emus. I istis. I erunt. Now for the next one, you might say, oh, itis and I istis are kind of different. What's going on there? Well, don't do that. You're making the wrong comparison. Rather, compare iistis to the singular. They're identical except for the plural has an s. Okay? So that's why those two are like that. Notice, however, though, they still both have a tis. All right, so I go and I went. You go and you went. He, she, it goes and he, she, it went. We go and we went. Y'all go and y'all went. And they go and they went. Okay, so hopefully you're starting to note the differences between these two. So let's practice it now. I e, I isti, I it, I imus, I istis, I erunt. And hope that's what you said. And the translation is has or have gone or went. All right, you try it. Ready, go. Hopefully that's what you said. Say it a third time, just from memory. Ready, go. Alrighty, and hopefully that's what you said. And the translation is has or have gone or went. Alright, now, remember the prefixes? Of course, we can also stick prefixes onto these things. So, ad fui was or were present, or has or have been present. Ad ee -e went toward, or has or have gone toward. Alright? So, ad fuerunt, y'all were present, versus ad eerunt, y'all went toward or approached. So, compare them. Ad fui ad ee -e, ad fuisti, ad eeisti, ad fuit, ad eeit, ad fuimus, ad eeimus, ad fuistis, ad eeistis, and ad fuerunt and ad eerunt. Hooray. All righty. Then we can do the same with ab. Nothing different there. X e e. I went out. X e e. Y'all went out. X e e. He she it went out. X e e. Most we went out. X e e. Y'all went out. And X e e. They went out. Ready e. I returned. Ready e. You went back. Ready e. He she it went back. Ready e. Most we returned. Ready e. Y'all went back. And ready e. They went back. And lastly, prodii, I went forward. Prodiisti, you went forthward. Prodii, they went forth. Prodiimus, we went forthward. Prodiistis, forward, y'all went. And prodierunt, they've gone forward. All right, so now you try these. Um, translate it into English, and you can say he, she, or it, whichever one you want. Just pick one. Stop the video and start it again when you're ready to see the answers. And the answers. 
All right. No problems there, I hope. And now try these. Answer it with one Latin word, not counting num or none, because those are just helper words. Okay, so stop the video and start it when you're ready to see the answer. Of course, the left column is all perfect, the right column is mixed. And the answers? Hopefully you're really watching out for the difference between blanked and was blanking. So like was versus was being. Was would be perfect tense. Was being is ongoing, so that would be imperfect tense. All right. Irregular drills. First in color, then in black and white. Tell me what tense each one of these belong in before I move it there. First we'll do in color, then in a second we'll do it all in black and white. Present, correct. There's one of your perfects. Imperfect. Notice the separation there. There's the separation in a U there. Again, the same. There's the weird one. There's the with the U as its separation. And last but not least, that. And now here's our new sign of the perfect tense, signifying a break or hiatus in the voice. Imperfect and perfect. All righty. And don't forget the passive forms that often occur. And note that the F disappears in pot foo into just being a potu. All right, now you do it in black and white. Tell me what tense it is before I move it there. Right, and remember pot foo condenses to pot two. All right, so this is getting complex. You may have to make a deliberate effort to learn some of these and keep them straight. All right, Latin to English. Give it in just one word, not counting the known if it's a negative. Okay, so stop the video and start it when you're ready to see the answers. And the answers? All right, so here you're starting to see whether or not you really are good at knowing these paradigms or not. Um, watch out for the passive voice, which I have one right there, and I think that's it. For the next assignment, remember that the questions and answers are answered by themselves if they're third person, or by the other person if they're first or second. You're used to this. All right, so do the first column on the left where you're going to confirm every question positively. Stop the video and start it when you're ready to see the answers. And the answers? 
Now on the right, remember, Noom expects a no, so you say it in a cynical tone of voice, and you want to contradict it in this right column. So if they're expecting a no, you answer yes. Or if they're expecting a yes, because they say no na, no na, then you better contradict it with rather, immo. All right, so here's the first one. They're not really going to go, are they? Expecting a no, they're not going to go. You contradict it and say, yes, they are going to go, just like that. All right, so stop the video and start it when you're ready to see the answers. And the answers? Okay, so you notice we have a passive form there, and that's it. So if you could do this column, then you've got the perfect tenses active voice about as well as I could possibly expect. So from now on, you need to start learning all four principal parts of every verb. If you go to a writing assignment and click on the chapter word lists, and then scroll down to chapter 21, and let's zoom in on this, you'll see that in previous chapters, I only gave you two principal parts of a verb. Now in chapter 21, and from now on, there's going to be four principal parts to the verb, and you need to memorize all four. Um, the third one is what we used in this video. The fourth one, wictus, is what we will use in the next video. So you need to just close your eyes and recite winko, winkeret, wiki, wictus. The first conjugation, of course, will be easy, but it's the other ones that you really need to recite over and over and over because they're so variable that the only way you'll remember them, if I ask you to say the perfect tense of deceive, you won't be able to do it unless you have recited follow, follow, fefeli, falsus in your mind so that you know that the past tense is fefeli and its past stem is fefel. So all these are what you need to re be reciting mentally in your mind. And if you go to Quizlet, like vocab B, then you will see that I now give you not just the present tense cards, like follow, followa, to deceive, but I also give you a past tense card, fefeli falsus, deceived. So you have one card for the first two and another card for the last two. And the last two just have this generic meaning, deceived. It, one is a verb, like I deceived you, and the other is a participial adjective, like I feel deceived right now as an adjective. So get in the habit of learning all four principal parts from now on. In fact, you probably, if you are a responsible student, want to go back before chapter 21 to all these previous chapters and learn relearn all the orange verbs that you have already learned all the way to the start of the course. This time, however, also learning the third and fourth principal part. And to help you do this, down in the link in the video description below this video, I have a link to the chapter 21 vocab addendum. And if you click that, you will get this PDF in which all your verbs that you have learned so far are grouped first according to tense sign, like V and U, and far over there, S, and then at the bottom, just having them straight in order with the various tense signs colored in different ways. So an underline here is reduplication. A tense sign letter is bold, like V or S. Same with a length and stem vowel, like weedy. So you can either do it this way, in the order in which you learned the verbs, or you can do it this way, which I recommend, in which you group all the verbs first by their tense sign, and then within that by their conjugation. First and second conjugation, third conjugation, fourth conjugation, and then irregular verbs after that. So there's a lot to learn in this chapter. Even if you don't take the time to memorize these, because, yeah, I know there are a lot here, it would be really good to at least once go through and recite every single one of these. So you don't need to do first conjugation because those will always forever and ever amen follow this pattern here. But the other ones you do need to recite. 
Delio, Deleire, Delewi, Deleitus, Arceso, Arcesera, Arcesiwi, Arcesitus. And as you say this, listen for the similarity between verbs of the same tense sign group. Desino, Desinere, Desiwi, Desitus. Peto, Petera, Petiwi, Petitus. If you get really good at this, then you will be able to predict, based on just the sound of the first two principal parts, what the third and fourth principal parts probably are going to be. And you can't do that unless you've recited it a whole lot so that you know what to expect. So I highly suggest that you stop the video and recite this whole thing right now. And then you'll notice a different sound when you get into the U's and a different sound when you get into the length and stem vowels. Some of them have no tense sign, and then some of them have bizarre third and fourth principal parts. So there's a whole new horizon to be dealing with at this point. Make sure you watch the next video in which we're going to cover the passive voice and also the two past tense infinitives. We had the present infinitives back in chapters 11 and 12, but now we're going to do the past tense infinitives in the next video. All right, wallet. Welcome to the second half of the video, and here we are going to cover the passive voice of the perfect tense. First, before we start, we have to re-review what these symbols mean. The thumb towards you means I, you, he, she, it, we, y'all, they. And then in the passive voice, I am blanked, you are blanked, he, she, it is blanked, we are blanked, y'all are blanked, and they are blanked. Okay, formation. How do you form the passive of the perfect tense? Now, this is going to be kind of weird. Here is what you know so far, and you can see in the green ones that every single tense of you, that you have known so far makes its passive voice down here, down low, using the arvister, mermenienter endings. However, those were all in the present system which means that they have a present stem. You can see the green woka at the start of each one of these three. But now we're going to get our first tense from the past system, and that uses the orange stem in the active, and so it's going to do something weird here in the passive. And what it's going to look like is this. Oh my goodness, what's that wokatus? Well... That is not your third, which you used in the active, but now your fourth principal part. So anytime you look in a dictionary, you're going to use this fourth principal part to make the passive. Get that again. Third is the active. Fourth is the passive. Okay? And you can see down below here that the way you view this, the active is wokav, which is the passive, the perfect stem leaning against these e s d at endings. But the passive is actually two words. So I demonstrate that as like a balloon here, because a balloon is separate from the thing that's holding it. And so we're going to start off the passives up here on the roof of the House of Latin. All right. So that's how your perfect tense is going to go. Okay, so Wokawi, wokawisti, wokawit, wokawimus, wokawistis, wokawerunt is active, have called, or just called. And the passive is going to use this helper verb, the present tense of soon. So that's going to go like this. So wokata sum, wokatis est, wokatis est, wokati si sumus, wokati estis, and wokati sunt. And of course, we don't want to be discriminatory. You could use either of the other two genders in the pink or the gray. Literally, this translates as having been called, I am, or I am having been called. Um, but of course, we don't want to say it that stiltedly. We want to make it into something more natural, like have been called or was called. Was called, don't confuse this with the imperfect passive. That was was being called, implying ongoingness or incompleteness. This one is just was called without, without the b word being. However, some people mix the two, and so sometimes was called could be used for either the perfect or the imperfect. Notice that although wokati, wokata, and wokata 
are participles and could decline in any of the case numbers or genders, like vocatis or vocatorum. However, when it's used with sum, then you have to have the nominative, because only a nominative can be the doer of sum. So that's why when this gets used as part of a verb, it must have a nominative ending. All right, and so let's see how this constructs. The active was like that. The passive is going to be like this. And we'll cut assume you are called, he, she, it is called, we are called, y'all are called, and they are called. Add on the feminine or the neuter optionally. And the translation of this is going to be has or have been called or was called, like that. All right, so where did this come from? This is kind of a weird stilted form. We'll cut to sum. Why do we need to have two words just to say the passive of something that only took one word? Well, this tractatus or vocatus, fourth principal part, is known as the perfect passive participle, or PPP, um, as distinct from the present active participle, which is the only participle that you already know. Well, here is a new one, and the typical translation for this is having been blanked. But that's really wordy. In English, we would just say blanked. What again is a participle? Think back in your memory. A participle is an adjective with verbal content inside of it. So dragged is an adjective. Like I can say, I am blue, angry, and dragged by the car. All of these are adjectives, but the last one is a participle with that notion of past dragging inside of it. So as an adjective, it can decline, but as a piece of a passive verb, it cannot, and it must be nominative. Um, so feminine would be like this, neuter would be like that, but now let's put it together with a verb. If we put est next to it, then it becomes is having been blanked, or more concisely, just has been blanked, or even was blanked. So the, the idea of this is like we say in English, I am dragged, or I am smitten, or I am hated. We say it in the present tense, am, but you and I understand that it is a past tense verb. Because if I am the adjective hated right now, then that means that someone was hating me back then to result in this current situation. So that's how present hated now implies was hated, passive voice of the past. So this is kind of a complex construction bordering the line between present if you consider the verb as just est, or past, if you consider the verb as tractatus est. So it's all how you choose to view it. It's your choice. But normally, I would ask you to view this as a past tense, because that's a more complete and fuller understanding of the construction tractatus est. But if you look back at your House of Latin, Notice how that past tense is leaning up against the present. So the idea of the perfect is that although it happened in the past, yet its effectiveness or its import is kind of for now in the present. Okay, so let's do another. Tractata, nominative, is just the participle. Could, just means dragged. But est means is having been dragged, or is dragged, or has been dragged, and there's your perfect passive, or was dragged. And that's the opposite, of course, of traxit, which is active. He dragged. All right, tractatum. Adjective plus est becomes is having been dragged, or has been dragged, or was dragged. And traxerunt, they dragged. So they dragged, and it was dragged. Okay, so our three genders are tractati, tractati, tractata, meaning having been blanked. And now notice what number are these, singular or plural? 
plural. So are we going to put an est onto this? No, we're going to put on a sunt, meaning are having been dragged. And as that, they are no longer a participle, but they're actually a perfect passive verb. And the translation is have been dragged or were dragged. All right, so you should be getting in the hang of these now. Tractati, tractati sunt is the opposite of traxerunt. Tractati, tractati sunt is the opposite of traxerunt. Tractata, tractata sunt is the opposite of traxerunt. All right, let's go through the paradigms now. Let's do all the possibilities. Remember that Active is wokawi isti it imus istis erunt, and passive is wokatus a um sum es est sumus est sunt. Alrighty. So, you tell me, what tense is this, and what voice is it? Well, hopefully you recognize that this is just your boring old vanilla present active. Woko wokas wokat. Wokabam, wokabas, I was calling. Wokabar, wokabaris, I was being called. Wokawi, wokawisti, I called, perfect. Um, here is your new form, perfect passive. And future what? Bor bears bitur passive. And present passive and future. Alrighty, so that was pretty easy. See if you can do this with just black and white. So stop the video, attempt these, and then start it again when you're ready to see the answers. Alright, now let's make it harder. Now let's have you pick a random form out of these. Alright, so let's try some of these. The way this works is that you push the start button and then you stop it somewhere, and wherever it stops, then you use the hand up here in the center, or no matter which of the forms it is, to tell what person and number that is in the tense where the moving thing is. So in this case, future perfect, second person plural of woko wokari wokawi wokatus would be wokaweritis, right? Let's check. Hit the toggle answers button, and yes, woka where it is is correct. All right, so let's do another one. Start it again and stop it. And now down here in the passives, we want the passive imperfect again, second person plural. So that's going to be woka bomini, right? Woka bomini, right? So hopefully you can do it about as fast as I can do it. And so practice this as much as you feel like you need to until you feel confident that you can, at a reasonable pace, give any one of these 12 tenses or voices. And so go ahead and stop the video and try this, and then start it again when you're ready to do third and fourth conjugation. Okay, and then here's a third and fourth conjugation, which you can see over here in the future is slightly different. So watch out for that. So now attempt these and um, I pluperfect Traxaram. Hopefully you can do it about that fast. That's the answer. And try these and then hopefully you'll get a few futures over here so that you try the hard part. Then once you feel confident, you're done with perfect passives. And that's pretty much it. You are now functioning with perfect passive verbs. So I hope you are feel confident when you step into the actual stories and writing these perfect passives in your work. Walete!